Hi, my name is Beth Sandy, and I'm a nurse practitioner in the Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. I'm going to talk today about targeted therapy for non-small cell lung cancer, toxicity profile of antibody drug conjugates. These are my disclosures. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from AstraZeneca. And our learning objectives are to improve coordination and communication within the multidisciplinary cancer care team to optimize outcomes for patients with non-small cell lung cancer being treated with ADCs. Review potential toxicities associated with ADCs in non-small cell lung cancer and discuss management strategies for different toxicities across the ADCs approved or in development for non-small cell lung cancer. So let's talk about the toxicities in this portion. So there's really only one antibody drug conjugate actually approved in non-small cell lung cancer, and that's trastuzumab deruxtecan, which I'll also refer to as TDXD. The toxicity is actually very widely dependent on the ADC that you're using because the payload drug associated with that ADC is different for many of these drugs, and so they may have different associated toxicities. Other drugs that are under investigation for non-small cell lung cancer are data DXD, patritimab deruxtecan or HER3-DXD, and sasituzumab govitecan. We are going to touch on some of these toxicities as well. So first of all, why do these toxicities occur? You know, oftentimes we think about antibody drug conjugates as being a targeted therapy. So we think of targeted therapies as having less toxicity. But in reality, even though that antibody drug conjugate is targeting a receptor, so as you can see on the left-hand side here, um, it is a monoclonal antibody, and that monoclonal antibody will target a receptor on the cancer cell. However, it carries with it that cytotoxic payload. So that's the conjugate of the drug. And that's what makes it hopefully an effective medication because it can enter the cell through that target using the, the linker. And then that cytotoxic payload is then released and hopefully kills that cancer cell. However, there's definitely going to be other toxicities associated because number one, um, there's sometimes expression of that target protein on non-cancer cells, especially those that are in that microenvironment. And that's where often we'll see this bystander effect that we talk about, whereas there's other normal cells that are in the vicinity of that cancer cell, and they may experience some of that cytotoxic payload um, and therefore have some toxicity to those normal bystanders. Often also is that the location and mechanism of that cleavable linker um, can also cause some toxicity because, um, the more potent or cleavable that linker is, the more likely that cytotoxic payload is going to release, which is a good thing. But again, you are risking some additional toxicity with that. So we know that we're going to have some bystander effect to the normal cells. We know that the cancer cell itself is going to experience that cytotoxic payload of the chemotherapeutic agent. So there is going to be some chemotherapy toxicity associated with this, even though we do consider these to some degree a targeted therapy. So let's first talk about the toxicities of uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan or TDXD. This is, like I said, the only drug that actually has an FDA approval in non-small cell lung cancer right now. And this is based on the Destiny Lung O2 trial. Um, and it's approved at 5.4 milligrams per kilograms. And you can see on the left-hand side of this slide, the general toxicities that we see. Again, often a lot of these are typical of what we might see with chemotherapy, things like nausea, fatigue. Um, you know, you can see basically over half of people had nausea and even 4% had severe nausea that required dose reduction likely at grade three or four. Um, some significant fatigue, decreased appetite, a lot of GI stuff here, some both constipation and diarrhea. And then on the right-hand side, you see laboratory toxicities. So again, consistent with that chemotherapy or toxic payload that's delivered to the tumor cell, you're going to have chemotherapy-like side effects. So we see neutropenia, and it's pretty significant with this drug sometimes. So about half of patients have all grades, but almost 20% of patients will have a grade three, four, which is an ANC of less than 1,000. Um, so sometimes we may encounter dose reductions um, or dose delays based on this. 
anemia occurs in about 36%, and 10% of those patients had a grade three, four anemia that likely required a blood transfusion. Thrombocytopenia was also listed, though not quite as high of a grade three, four rate as anemia and neutropenia. And then transaminase increases, see that's about typical of what we see with general chemotherapy agents. We usually see some mild transaminases, but rarely do we see severe grade three, four, um, only about 3% of patients where we had to hold drug or dose reduce. How do we manage these toxicities? Well, this is data that's taken from a patient who was, um, where they describe patients with breast cancer receiving this drug, where more patients have received um, in that cohort of patients, not specific to non-small cell lung cancer, though I don't have any reason to think that this would be significantly different in patients with lung cancer. Um, and this is not uncommon. Um, so you can see that we would recommend like a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist and dexamethasone, um, considering this to be a low to moderately emetogenic um, chemotherapy. And, and then if patients experience side effects, either adding that NK1 and or olanzapine as well pre-treatment. Certainly in those days following, um, a dexamethasone taper is often good to use. Olanzapine you can use as a taper as well. Clopramide is listed here. I tend to not use as much of that due to some drug interactions that can occur. So I like dexamethasone or medical or um, olanzapine here in this delayed setting. Neutropenia, um, you can use prophylaxis with GCSF. I can say I don't generally use it for prophylaxis. However, if a patient does experience um, a dose delay due to neutropenia at um, day 21, a lot of times I will institute it then going forward. And certainly the education for patients that neutropenia can be an issue in avoiding, um, you know, infection. If we can, which is not too common, and we don't really, um, you know, do a whole lot of pre-medication here, you can see that there are certain things listed, um, but, you know, we generally are going to use the dexamethasone and the antiemetics for our patients. And then if they have an infusion reaction, we can add um, and histamines in the future. There certainly is some alopecia associated, um, and so scalp pulling can be instituted if your patient is interested in that. Um, you know, fatigue and pneumonitis, we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, and decreased LVEF, so it wasn't super high with this drug like we've seen with other drugs such as adriamycin or trezetuzumab itself. Um, but this is something that you want to be on top of and looking for signs and symptoms and, you know, maybe checking something like a MUGA scan or an echocardiogram if indicated. So let's go on and talk about pneumonitis. So pneumonitis is something in particular in lung cancer we do worry about um, given that they already have diseased lungs. Um, so you can say, see that pneumonitis or ILD, kind of one in the same there, um, these are the rates. So all patients, about 12.9% of patients, in this 5.4 milligram per kilogram cohort of Destiny Lung O2. Now, interestingly, they parsed this out by patients who had prior immunotherapy exposure because this drug is approved in the second line setting right now. So a lot of these patients have had chemo and or immunotherapy up front. So it was a little bit higher um, in those patients, about 15% in the patients who had prior immunotherapy exposure versus only 7.4% in patients who did not have prior immunotherapy exposure. So this could be something that could pre, um, pre, pre, get, predispose them for this. Um, you can see the grading, typically we'll see mostly grade two, which is symptomatic, um, but manageable. Um, but you can see that there was, you know, one to 2% grade three, four, and even some grade fives or deaths. Um, we know that the rates were higher in the 6.4 milligram cohort, and that's why really the 5.4 milligram cohort um, did get approved. The rates of ILD in that cohort were very similar to the breast cancer rates at that same dose. So we do feel comfortable giving this dose. But again, it is something that we need to watch out for our patients to have. This is an example of one of my patients, 64-year-old woman who's a never smoker with locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer adenocarcinoma subtype, a HER2 mutation. And I put on the right-hand side there just, again, to show what this may look like um, in a molecular path report. It's not always totally obvious. So it's an exon 20. Um, and it's found in the exon 20. It's an ERB2, also known as HER2. 
This patient was treated initially with pemetrexid, carboplatin, and pembrolizumab for four cycles. And at progression, she started TDXD. And after two cycles, you can see on the left was her baseline CAT scan. And then on the right, she had developed cough, shortness of breath, hypoxia, and we rescanned her after two cycles. And that's what we found, that ground glass opacities there in her right lung, um, you know, consistent with pneumonitis. So how do we manage this? You know, the median onset was 49 days, so it typically doesn't happen right away. Um, for a patient who has symptoms, you need to get that CAT scan of the chest to diagnose it. A grade one is asymptomatic, so you can interrupt therapy. Um, you don't have to use steroids, and if it resolves on its own, you can rechallenge them. Um, they do say anything beyond grade one, you're supposed to permanently discontinue the drug. Um, so that's any symptomatic ILD pneumonitis. And that's different from immunotherapy. Immunotherapy, even when they're symptomatic of pneumonitis, will manage it with steroids and rechallenge them. Um, you know, I think with this one, they feel that this is a more potent um, and worrisome ILD. So per the package insert, anything that's symptomatic, um, you are to permanently discontinue it and give steroids and taper over a long period of time, 14 days or longer. Uh, even for steroid refractory cases, you can consider other immunosuppressive agents, even though this isn't typically immune related like it is with immunotherapies. Let's talk about some of the drugs that are under investigation. This is Dato DXD. Um, this is looking at the Tropion Lung 01 um, and some of the um, toxicities that came out of this trial versus docetaxel. Um, some of the main things that we saw with Dato DXD were things like stomatitis. Um, over half of patients. And interestingly, the development of stomatitis actually asso was associated with improved outcomes. So this is something we're going to want to manage. Um, ocular events, dry eye being the most common thing that, that we saw, um, but they can get dry, irritated, itchy eye symptoms. Um, and then also here we see drug-related ILD, which we just covered with um, TDXD not quite to the percentages that we saw with TDXD, but certainly something that can happen. And note there was 2% grade five um, deaths, you know, from, from this. So the discontinuation rate to note was 0.7% due to stomatitis. So most people did not have to discontinue, but there were certainly patients who had to either dose reduce or hold um, and manage that. So what do we do about stomatitis? So, Preventing it is great. So gentle teeth brushing, using a soft toothbrush, um, daily flossing, but don't floss if you're bleeding or if it becomes painful. Um, you know, good oral hygiene, um, non-alcohol mouthwashes, of course. You can use steroid-containing mouthwashes four times a day, swish and spit. I gave an example here of dexamethasone, 0 0.1 milligrams per ml. Um, you know, I've used this with other agents. Um, you know, if this is something that is of a concern, you can use this prophylactically. And then management, again, to make sure they're using bland mouthwashes, maybe salt water with baking soda, pain management, um, some sort of topical management for uh, areas of soreness, referral to a dentist or oral surgeon to help. You can use ice chips. It's not clear how much this can help, but at the during the infusion, if you hold them in the mouth, you know, sometimes that can hopefully decrease blood flow and decrease drug exposure to the mouth. How about the ocular toxicities? So these are a couple patients of mine that I showed. Um, the guy on the top, you can see like sort of drainage around there. And my guy on the bottom just had really dry red um, eyes right around, like on the lids and underneath of the eyes. So prophylactically, we tell people not to use contact lenses and use lubricating artificial teardrops. The management um, right now is, you know, ophthalmic eye exams if the toxicity occurs. Um, you know, other ADCs have used prophylactic steroids, lubricant, vasoconstrictive drops. Um, you know, this has not been recommended yet with data DXD given the lower incidence than other antibody drug conjugates. Um, the use of eye cooling packs, um, you know, these are those things, ladies, that we use at the spa. You put like the cold eye packs or cu cold cucumbers on your eyes. Um, that's something that could be considered. Um, it was mentioned in the literature. There's no data behind it, but probably can't hurt. Um, toxicity of patritimab DDXD. This is your HER3 DDX, DXD, HER3 DXD. Um, and this is the most common toxicities here, um, sort of in the swimmer's plot. You can see a lot of nausea here, 
Um, the majority of it was grade one, too, but certainly 66% of people. Again, following that same theme as trastuzumab drugs, Tcam, um, same payload. D DXD is same payload here. So you're seeing a lot of these chemotherapy-like side effects, neutropenia, anemia, thrombocytopenia, GI toxicities. Um, you know, this one, the neutropenia rate what, for grade three, four was almost 20%. So um, this is something that you may want to seriously consider using GCSF for this. Um, certainly proper anti-emetic therapy. Um, this is probably one that I would go full on with the 5-HT3 NK1 receptor and um, dexamethasone. You can see 5.3% of patients developed ILD. So a little bit less than the other two that we talked about, but certainly something that can occur. And then let's finish up talking about toxicities of sasituzumab govotica. So a little bit of a different... Uh, payload with this one. This is the Evoke 01 trial. Um, so this was single agent. You can see on the left-hand side is the sesotuzumab govotecan. The right-hand side was docetaxel in the control arm. So had a similar number of overall toxicities, certainly fatigue, but diarrhea was really the big story here, neutropenia and diarrhea. So you'll see that 42% of patients had diarrhea 10% of which was grade three, four. Remember, that means greater than seven stools per day. Um, and then neutropenia, 25% of patients had a grade three, four neutropenia, meaning an ANC of less than 1,000. So these are two of the common toxicities. This was the Evoke 2 trial that looked at adding pembrolizumab to sassy govotecan. And again, similar things seen here, that diarrhea, and then you see the neutropenia in the middle there, but the majority of the neutropenia was actually grade three, four. So what do we do with the diarrhea here? Um, you know, the grade three diarrhea was 10%. Um, if they develop acute diarrhea with their first infusion going forward, we would recommend giving the atropine 0.2 milligrams IV every 15 minutes for two doses, similar to the way that we manage patients with arinotecan when we're giving that. Obviously, at the delayed onset of diarrhea at home, we would use like over-the-counter loperamide, dietary management as well, and then other anti-diarrheals that are prescription if that's not helping. Obviously, if it's severe diarrhea, you would need to hospitalize them and get support them with IV fluids in addition to the anti-diarrhea management. So in conclusion, there are several ADCs that are emerging in non-small cell lung cancers. These may be approved in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors or single agents. That sometimes can complicate the toxicity profile. Unique toxicities vary between agents. Um, a lot of it's chemotherapy-like, but some of them have the stomatitis and the ocular toxicities as well. So there's newer toxicities here, especially those ocular ones. We need to you know, use our multidisciplinary team to help us manage these. Um, and sometimes they can be dose limiting. Thank you very much for listening. I appreciate your time.